95 people online, uh, which is great. And it's uh, my very pleasant duty to welcome everybody here. So, uh, my name is Fred Watson. I have the great honour to be Australia's astronomer at large. And it is my privilege to welcome everybody to this 2020 Alison Levick lecture, the first time in its history that it has been presented over the internet. And it's been going for 20 years or so. Uh, but I'd like to start by taking the opportunity to acknowledge the First Nations people of Australia and elders past, present and emerging. Uh, the first astronomers in our country who uh, were the people who really started looking at the stars from here. So uh, normally when I uh, introduce these lectures, I have to tell everyone where the emergency exits are and things like that. But tonight you're on your own in that regard. Um, you'll have to find your own exit. Uh, but there is a bit of housekeeping uh, if I can just take the time to do that. Uh, if you have questions uh, during Jason's presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll We'll, um, uh, so, uh, we'll monitor them all and uh, hopefully we'll have a good question and answer session at the end rather than uh, Jason interrupting his presentation. I know what it's like when you're trying to give uh, an, an online presentation. It's better just to keep going and deal with all the questions at the end. Um, and I also have to tell everyone that the lecture is being recorded. Uh, so that the Alison Levick lecture is an interesting thing in its own right. It was funded by a bequest from a Mr. Jack Alison Levick, who was a Melbourne psychiatrist, but he had a lifelong interest in astronomy. And he'd seen photographs taken with the telescopes of the former uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory, uh, where both Jason and I have worked, um, by uh, another good friend, astrophotographer David Malin. And so uh, Jack Alison Levick wanted to leave uh, a, um, basically a bequest in his will uh, for talks that would enhance the public understanding of astronomy. Uh, the governance of the observatory has now changed, but the fund continues to be administered by the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, uh, who I work for and hosted by uh, Macquarie University as the new home of the Sydney division of the uh, former AAO. Um, that's the story of the lecture. The story of our speaker tonight is equally Australian in flavour. Um, Jason is a, an old friend of Australia and an old friend of mine. <laughs> and I'm delighted to see, even though he's about 100 years younger than me, he's getting the same hairstyle, <laughs> which is very impressive. So Dr. Jason Sparamilio is the telescope scientist for what will be the largest visible light or optical telescope in the world, the 39 metre extremely large telescope, which is currently being built in northern Chile by the European Southern Observatory. And I might just mention in passing that we in Australia have a 10 year strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory, which allows Australian astronomers to use these or to use the facilities that currently exist, not the ones that are still in the future. Uh, those facilities are at La Silla Paranal Observatory, uh, among other places, but uh, Jason is a former director of La Silla Paranal, and that includes the four 8.2 metre unit telescopes of the very large telescope. Uh, Jason has a long association, as I mentioned, with Australia, having worked as a staff astronomer at the former AAO during the 1990s, seems like only yesterday. Um, he's also been involved with the Square Kilometre Array, uh, radio telescope. This is a major project, an international project. Uh, uh, half the telescope will be in Australia, half in Southern Africa. Uh, Jason helped to set up the design effort at the SKA headquarters in the UK. Uh, Jason, however, is now based in Munich and it is from a rather chilly Munich morning that he talks to us today. Jason's topic is telescopes and the discovery of the universe. It's all yours, Jason. Welcome to the Alison Levick Lecture. Thank you, thank you very much, Fred. I hope the technology survives this, uh, this process. So, um, thank you, Fred. Uh, kind words. Uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and thank you all for turning your videos on. I'm always quite unsure how to, uh, how to react to Fred since we've known each other, as you said, for quite a long time. And at the same time, he has exalted titles such as astronomer at large for an entire continent. 
I guess we can all live with that as Australia really is just a big island and you can't roam very far. Thankfully, looking up is, is unrestricted. So the, the telescope, what about the telescope? Well, at least part of this story will be about a really huge telescope. Uh, we could have called it the telescope. It could have had any number of nice names, but the exciting people ended up with extremely large. But that's a, a whole other story. Anyway, let's get back to, to the beginning of this, uh, of this process. So, uh, ah, this is good. Okay, there it goes, that's how it will work. So let's define uh, this telescope. Um, let's start with this looking up part that I just mentioned. Are we really looking up? Some telescopes don't even do that. Am I being a pedant in some bizarre relativistic coordinate frame transformation? Some of you may be, some of you who may know me may be guessing. No, firmly here on the ground with up, up and down, down, some telescopes actually look through the earth and some don't even care which way up is. So what is a telescope? The definition on the screen is that it is a telephone for the heavens. We just need to pick up. The analogy actually quite, works quite well. After all, the receiving end of the telephone captures the incoming signal, converts it into intelligible noises. The telescope does the same. The incoming signal may be a particle or a wave. The intelligible noise will be some sort of uh, data. So why, would, why do I think the telescope is so very special that I would make it at least the subject of, of my talk? Well, some of you may have telescopes in your backyard. And some of you may just like pictures of the heavens or just be curious. But astronomy is quite a remarkable enterprise. It's cutting edge science accessible to all. The small telescope in your backyard or your, your neighbors, you know, the one, the, the strange one who sits out there in the cold of the night staring at the sky, that small telescope can contribute real scientific discoveries. In fact, the term amateur is often confused as the opposite to professional with some connotation of professionalism having something to do with doing things right. In astronomy, in many, many cases, the distinction is only whether you get paid a wage for doing this. Amateur astronomers have telescopes that can make real discoveries and routinely do this in our, in our field. It's not necessarily something that you could say about amateur particle physics or amateur dentistry for that matter. So what's so special about looking up at the sky? Well, we've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, the, the sky has mesmerized all sighted people since the beginning of time. We see this in petroglyphs, we see it in culture propagated through the ages to this day. I mean, whether the culture is propagated in written form or verbal form is, is, is just uh, peripheral. The sky was our first clock. As our species moved from the equatorial regions further astray, they, the clock actually mattered, seasons mattered, and this for our survival. So time is at the heart of, of astronomy, and to this day it is actually a challenge uh, for, all us, for all of us. One might have thought that by now we would have liberated ourselves from the astronomical definition of time, but I fear we haven't even uh, liberated ourselves from the Druids. In any case, time remains tied to the Earth's rotation about the sun, so much so that every four years we add a whole day to our calendar and a leap second is added to your clock from time to time. It is clear that the astronomical definition of time still rules our lives. Let me assure you that this is a royal pain for people building telescopes as well. Yeah. But enough of all this, this is all at large kind of things and Fred should be, should be saying these things, uh, not somebody talking about the telescopes. You were promised telescopes, so telescopes it shall be. So what does a telescope look like? Well, this is a telescope. It's uh, buried in the Antarctic ice near the pole. What you're seeing is the above ground um, uh, control room. Kilometers under the ice, 
light sensitive detectors were placed there in the brief time between the hot drilling the hole and lowering the string of beads in it before it all froze up. The light sensitive beads wait for a neutrino to travel through the earth from the north, whichever way north is, depending on which way around you draw the map, okay, and interact in the pristine ice. And they emit a particle traveling at superluminal speeds. And therefore, you get this blue light called Cherenkov radiation. This, what you're seeing on your screen, is a neutrino telescope. Now, the neutrino is a fundamental particle which is pretty much massless, chargeless, and pretty much does not do anything. It doesn't interact with anything. Millions pass through your body every day and every night. They're emitted by the sun in their myriads and permeated, have permeated the universe since the very beginning. Most fascinatingly, they get emitted by a particular kind of supernova, which is things that I like, eh, when a star converts its a core into a neutron star. Anyway, the sky is super bright with neutrinos, they're just extremely shy. And by the way, the first indication that something has gone wrong inside the sun will come from the neutrinos. Not that you'll be able to do anything about it, but yeah, it might be nice to know. Um, this is also a telescope. This is Virgo. It's a telescope in some fields near Pisa. Try and remember Pisa, it comes back in our, in our story later. It's a gravitational wave telescope. Depending on the direction in which the waves are coming uh, from, this telescope will shrink, one arm of this telescope will shrink relative to the other. And in the square building in the corner, this change will be detected. How much does one arm shrink relative to the other? Hmm. Less than the diameter of a proton. I, I, I love these comparisons. They are totally useless. Okay. Does anybody have a real feeling for the size of a proton? It's like saying that a particular telescope in Sydney could be, a, could be seeing a coin on a beach in Perth. First of all, no, it couldn't. If the coin was bright enough to be seen, it would have melted. And second, who on earth would want to do that? Anyway, so what does this measurement technology mean for real? It means that a bunch of super keen, super smart folks have managed to stabilize something so precisely that they get to play with the quantum properties of light in order to be making these measurements. They squeeze light. This is, this is super, super cool. So why would they do that? Well, that way they can detect a couple of neutron stars merging 120 million light years away. And let, okay, I'm going to, let's settle something uh, really upfront. I'm not going to tell you how many zeros that actually is in kilometers or any other unit. What difference does it make? It's far, far, far away. You may well ask now, so what have merging neutron stars done for me? Well, you being in Australia I, yeah, the, and digging up stuff being your source of wealth and apparently also national pride, you can be assured that merging neutron stars have done an awful lot for you because all the gold and the fancy metals have come from merging neutron stars. Anyway, this is also a telescope. Yeah? It's another one. This is a kind of a radio telescope. It was designed to communicate with satellites, but it turned out it was also super good at detecting radio waves emitted by the universe at a, at a very special time. See, when the universe was pretty young, like 300,000 years old, which for a 13.7 billion year thing is, is actually pretty young. Yeah? The universe did something quite remarkable. At pretty much the exactly the same time and all over the place, this soup of electrons and protons that, used, that were all together yeah, converted itself into atoms. So all the protons and all the electrons got together. And they got together to make helium and hydrogen atoms. And doing this created an instantaneous release of light. And as the universe expanded, this light got stretched, and now it reaches us as radio waves. So what's so special about this is that the universe did this all at the same time 
and all over the place. Places that didn't know about each other. The universe was big enough by then that these places were not causally connected. So how did they know to do it exactly right? How come these bits of the universe knew to do this all at the same time? And a lot of astronomy is about making maps. So I'm going to show you a map of the universe when, the, uh, when it was about that age. So this is the map of the universe when it was that age. Yeah? Super smooth. This is a measurement we make with telescopes. This is the map of the universe. Yeah? What it tells us is that the Big Bang worked. We may not know exactly how, but it did actually work. It also does something else. It tells us that in any direction, the universe is the same. Yeah? It matters not who, where you are. And this means we are not special. For that matter, nowhere else is special either. And not being special is super important. It actually separates mythology from fact. Yeah? So if not being special bothers you, I would recommend talking to your mom. My mom always told me I was special, so it was okay for me. Now, this is another telescope. And at this point, you're kind of wondering, is this guy just going to be showing us pictures of things that don't look like telescopes? Well, hold on, we, we're getting there, we're getting there. So this is the Murchison White Field Array in Western Australia. And as Fred said, I'm very fond of Australia, so the Western Australians, please don't be offended. I love being in Perth. But Murchison is really in the middle of nowhere in a state that's generally full of nowheres. And the MWA, its acronym, is there to look for the light that was emitted when the electrons, you know, the ones we were just talking about, were separated from their atoms half a billion years later. Okay? This we call the era of reionization. But basically, the universe can't really make its mind up. In any case, we think that the universe did not do it in such a smooth manner as it put things together. And this is something that we will come back to at the end of the talk, but this tells us how gravity works. And gravity is not that easy a thing. We, we've kind of messed up gravity. That's another, in any case, here is uh, just another another one of these things that doesn't look like a telescope. This is low far in the green fields of, of Holland, this, this station, although it's spread all over uh, Europe. Now, what I'd like to do for the rest of this talk, or a big chunk of the rest of the talk, is tell you about some telescopes that look like telescopes, because that's, I think, slightly more interesting for myself. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go to 1608. That's about 400, more, a bit more than 400 years ago. And a chap called Lippershe, yeah, the pronunciation actually varies depending on who, who is claiming him, invented the telescope in old Zealand. Okay? And that was about 30 years before Tasman actually set eyes on the new one. So just to get the, the time scales correctly. The chap that you're seeing in the picture is not Lippershe, that's, that's Galileo. Okay. Now, glass eyepieces had been in use for centuries. So why did it take so long to put two pieces at the either end of a, of a paper tube and actually uh, have a telescope? After all, Aristophanes, I'm Greek, so you're going to get bits of Greek stuff in here as well. But, uh, advertising. Has to, has to take place. In any case, Aristophanes, the, the Greek playwright, actually in, in a play called The Clouds, 2000 years before Lippershe, described glasses used to, to burn things. So lenses must have existed before that. Take it, take it from a Greek, we never invent things. Uh, ways of thinking, political systems, lots of those. But things, not so much. So, the Egyptians must have had these glasses before. And in fact, there are hieroglyphs suggesting that this, this were the case. So what took so long? Well, the quality of the glass was lousy. See, one lens 
was okay -ish. but two together, you had a snowball's chance of getting any light through this thing. But thousands of years later, an expert lens maker like Lipoche managed to make something that he patented. And that's, that's pretty cool because you can get to make money out of patents. Anyway, knowing something that is, knowing that something is doable uh, opens the door to plenty Johnny come lately. And one of them was Galileo. Now, post-rationalization has given Galileo a lot of stick on the grounds that others assume that since he was the first to use the telescope to look up, he must have claimed to have invented it. He, he himself never did this. In fact, he gave credit to, to the uh, lens makers in the low countries uh, explicitly. But how did this Lipoche telescope, Galilean telescope work? Well, light comes in one end and comes out of the other not particularly complicated. This is what lenses tend to do. Now, this, this device turned out to be pretty dangerous. I mean, everybody knows how much trouble Galileo got in, uh, into for looking up uh, around Pisa, in fact, the, the same Pisa that I was mentioning uh, earlier. But after all, if you're going to sideline God, you must expect to get some trouble. So what did the telescope do, to, do for you? It didn't, the telescope didn't sideline God. It did, however, set aside any literal reading of books about deities. It did shift religion into the mythological category of human activity. And this freedom to think is an outcome of people using the telescope and of course, many other things. In any case, the year that, New that Galileo died, Newton was born and Newton and Galileo certainly uh, in the list of the five greatest physicists of all time, the fact that they played with telescopes is peripheral to their importance, in fact, in, in terms of physics. In any case, Newton, in his 30th year, gifted the Royal Society a reflecting telescope. So how did that work then? Well, in the reflecting telescope, the light comes in one end, bounces around this telescope thing, and comes out some others it can come out of the side, it can come out of the back, it can come out in, in various places, but it basically bounces, it doesn't go through. And in fact, once you work out the mathematics, you can come up with various weird and wonderful designs. And uh, in, a, in a preview of the future, you are now shown how many mirrors we have in our, in our great telescopes. But you can come up with clever schemes uh, for uh, imaging the heavens. Now, the reflecting telescope relies on um, mirrors and shiny surfaces in the days of uh, Newton were made out of metal. Yeah? And therefore, they were not really very shiny, did not stay shiny for very long, and generally had poor optical qualities. Now, for our story here, Newton appears for two reasons. One is inventing the reflecting telescope. It's pretty good. You could just rest on your laurels with that. Yeah? But he also noted that the atmosphere was a real pain. He actually wrote this down so that you know, it wasn't just that he, he said it. And that putting a telescope in a good place was much better than putting a telescope in a bad place. And we'll come back to, to that part. In any case, lenses were superior for some time and uh, they, people kept on using lenses. And much was done with lenses by opticians in London and also, since it's my neighborhood here, uh, Munich in the early 1800s. But much of this was driven by surveying needs, not astronomy. You see, Napoleon had conquered most of Europe. And immediately you go, what, uh, what, what's he brought Napoleon into this for? Well, if you have conquered, you have lots of land to redistribute. And if you have lots of land to redistribute, you have to actually measure it up. And measuring it up needs very good precision instrumentation and optics. And the guy you went to for this precision instrumentation and optics was a chap called Fraunhofer. And he was in Munich. And in fact, you also went to Fraunhofer when you wanted the best telescopes, like the one that's on your screen right now, which is in the Deutsches Museum in Munich, a very nice place that you should visit at some point when Corona times are over. 
in any case, Fraunhofer could, you could have a whole talk about Fraunhofer and that's, that's another subject. So lenses, lenses were doing well, but you can't make them really as big as you, as you would like. And um, as we've been saying, all the greats of, uh, of physics and science at some point played with telescopes. So this thing here is Foucault's telescope. Now, those of you, some of you may remember Foucault is the guy who fiddled with uh, pendulums. And I think if people remember Foucault, they'll remember him for pendulums. But for astronomers, he's remembered as the guy who made the telescope work. What do you mean? Well, you see, Foucault worked out something really rather unimpressive. That glass was actually a better material than metal to make a mirror with. It is better behaved. You can polish it better. The problem was that it wasn't very shiny. So he coated the glass. Now, that sounds quite easy. But in fact, coating is not simple. It's, it remains to this day and uh, partly an art that is uh, achieved by specialists in observatories. There's always the guy who does the coating as so, so, so a bit so, special person. In any case, now we can actually start making big telescopes. We no longer look through the glass, we look at the glass. This is, this is pretty good. It, along the way, Foucault also developed all the testing to have for the glass to have the right shape, the tools to support it. Other people came along and worked out all kinds of fancy mechanics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you see, the fundamental thing is that polishing glass is relatively straightforward. You just rub on it. You have to know where to rub and for how long, but it is just a matter of rubbing on it. Now, at this point, you're asking yourselves, I guess. Are we done with all of this historical stuff? Where's he going with all of this? I could read this stuff in a book. In fact, you may say, Fred wrote a book about all of this stuff some years ago. Is Jason demonstrating he can read? Well, obviously and tautologically, we're getting to right here where we are. Coating glass is the reflecting surface. The telescope can get bigger. Before we, we move on, we need to sort out a couple of more things about building a telescope. You see the stars, oops, ah, that should not have happened. Okay. The stars move. Okay. Now, there are those of us who believe that it's the Earth spinning about its axis, turning about the sun, and the stars moving in the sky is an illusion caused by our strange frame of reference. Others, there are few, but quite vociferous these days, have another opinion. None of this is of any relevance to the telescope. It doesn't care about any of this sophistry. The stars make circles at 15 arc seconds per sec uh, seconds of arc for every second of time. And a telescope stuck on the Earth has to be able to follow them. Which brings us to the biggest bugbear of astronomy. And the darkness here is semi deliberate. The photographic plate, or its modern successor, the digital camera. A system that allows you to catch photons for a period of time and think about them later. The guy to blame, Henry Draper, a doctor in New York, this fellow. Okay? Now, this photographic plate, digital detector, is excellent news for being able to see faint things, but really bad news for the telescope. See, before the invention of photography, a keen observer was somebody who had carrots for dinner, and a good telescope was one that had enough of a field of view that you could move your head in it or your eye and follow the stars it moved around. Okay? Now, the, uh, the photographic plate changes all of this. See, the eye blinks, you're done. Your brain, what does your brain remember? What you last saw, it's all okay. But the photographic plate, ah, it could integrate for minutes. It could collect light for time. And you could look at it later at your leisure. Suddenly, a small telescope that could hold the stars fixed 
was much more powerful than a big telescope that couldn't. Um, for local color, um, this is your local astrophotographer. And these are stars moving around the AAT. I couldn't possibly not show the AAT. I couldn't possibly not show you a picture of David Malin if he's in the audience. Hi, Dave. And now we continue with the story. In any case, to get all of this to work, the telescope is no longer just an optical system. Okay? It's a telescope, it's a mechanical system, it's a clock. It has bearings, actuators, support systems, encoders, etc. Bearings, of course, are uh, mechanical engineers' uh, favorite thing as far as I can make out. They, they love bearings, they, they absolutely love bearings. One of the things that makes big telescopes work are things that are called hydrostatic bearings. These are super cool uh, bearings that are, allow two surfaces to slide across each other on a thin film of oil or, or water, if, uh, if you want. They came from gun turrets for battleships. They didn't, were not made for astronomers. So you never know which technology will actually help you. In any case, we have this telescope. It's a fancy mechanical clock. A radio telescope's a fancy digital clock. So it's okay. So you can, so don't, don't worry about that. And the heavens are our metronomes. Okay. So all of this engineering, where's, where's, it, where's it actually taking us? It's taking us to this. This is the 200 inch at Mount Paloma. It started working just after the war. It took uh, 20 years until something almost as good could be seen on the horizon and 50 years before there was something that was actually bigger and worked as well, if not necessarily better. Okay? It is quite a testament to the scientific, economic and engineering prowess of uh, the United States. And much as I adore the AAT, 156 ain't 200. Anyway, so one more thing was actually becoming quite evident, which was that uh, it really mattered where you put the telescopes. The thing that Newton was mentioning uh, some decades, centuries before. So if you could actually stare for a long time, which the photographic plate gave you, how dark the sky was, really mattered. And in fact, how good the seeing was as well, how turbulent the atmosphere was. So in these days, we regularly observe sources that are actually from which we get one photon every 10 minutes or so. That's six photons an hour. Now, six optical photons an hour is all of 10 to the minus 21 watts. And I promise not to dazzle you with uh, large or very small numbers. So why now this? Well, I think it's quite a good indication of how silly what we're trying to do is. Surrounded by a world that is gorging itself on energy, it is hard to imagine that we're trying to see something so, so far away that it may be thousands of times dimmer than the darkest of the dark parts of the sky. Still, we do this. Is it masochism? Eh, maybe, but not really. In those photons is inscribed our past, and we would like to know. So we find the darkest and quietest and clearest and most tranquil spots, and we build our telescopes there. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of places that I like. This is Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is 4,200 meters above sea level. It's a volcano on the big island of Hawaii. It is the premier observing site in the Northern Hemisphere. And it provides, through the people of the Pacific Islands, it provides us a cultural connection to the roots of astronomy and navigation. And we're truly privileged to be able to observe the heavens from, from Mauna Kea. It is home to the two 10 meter Keck telescopes, to the 8.3 meter Subaru, 8.1 meter Gemini telescope, uh, an array of two to four meter telescopes and some submillimeter telescopes as well. Now you may uh, say, is this my favorite spot on earth? Eh, not even the fifth, but uh, I'll, I'll take you to my second favorite spot on earth. And this is Cerro Paraná. Okay. Cerro Paranal in the northern Atacama Desert in, in, in Chile is the home to the European Southern Observatories. They, they're the guys who pay me. 
a very large telescope. And it's the home for the array of the 8.2 meters that are there and also the interferometer. There's some nice source connections to Paranal. The lead engineer that uh, uh, led the assembly integration verification, Peter Gray, used to work at the AO. And one of our first generation instruments was a multi-object facility. Uh, this is where you get as many of the things that are in the field of view into your, into your instrument uh, called flames. And uh, that's on UT2, uh, the, the second one from the right, left, whatever, depending on how the screen is flipped in any case. Uh, uh, Flames is made out of two pieces, giraffe, the spectrograph built in France, and a positioner called OSPOS, it's an imaginative name, which was made in Mars field at the AO by folks who, some of whom may actually be in the, in the audience today. This uh, technology, this uh, expertise in robotic uh, positioners and fiber positioners, of which Fred is uh, not only a proponent, but also a master himself, is something that the Anglo-Australian Observatory uh, developed over many, many years in various uh, ever more sophisticated iterations, including the quite incredible two degree field on, on the Anglo-Australian telescope. And this was many, many decades. So this is, science is really about the long game. In any case, back, back to our Chilean desert uh, story. Um, I have to make sure I'm not doing too badly for time. I think it's okay. Um, it never rains, hardly ever. Once, once a year is too often. It's dry as a bone, truly, 10% humidity. There are no plants, no life, except for the people that run the observatory and some vermin. No, not the astronomer. Well, yeah, okay, include, yes, then. Let, let me. And you more or less observe every single night. Now, astronomers observing at big telescopes typically get a couple of nights per year, and a lot of this is also done remotely. Uh, so that's, that's okay. But if you're in the business of commissioning telescopes, which is kind of what I do, the runs are months and months long, and you do find yourself praying for cloudy weather. And it feels a bit sinful, but, but, but you do just for a break. Anyway, the gods of uh, the Atacama Desert don't often rain. So this is really a telescope. Okay. So you may ask why we put all of these on one spot and why we have these smaller ones. And uh, the reason for this is that uh, if you remember the gravitational wave thing that I told you, uh, that's an interferometer and we actually run the VLT as an interferometer as well. So to do this, you have to combine the light from the telescopes and make the system believe that they all belong to one mirror. So this, this means that the light that arrives first on one telescope has to be delayed to reach the instrument at the same time as the light that arrives last. And what do I mean by first and last? Well, if you say you're looking north, the northernmost telescope will get the light first and the southernest, southernmost telescope will get the light last. So under the ground in this observatory, there's some pretty fancy train set with some rails that are so precisely aligned that they do not follow the curvature of the earth, even over these 140 meters of distance, that delay the light so that it can arrive in the building in the middle, synchronized, and then injected into fibers that are wrapped around little drums that expand and contract to remove the last bit of differential delay. And each one of these telescopes has wobbly mirrors inside it that actually correct for the turbulence of the atmosphere. And all of this together is used to make incredible science. Okay. And it, you know, thousands of computers synchronized to absolute time, et cetera, et cetera, and all of that to do this. And it's not really photogenic, right? Now, science communication would have you believe that, you know, it's all zing, pow, wow, okay? But it really isn't. You now, for every zing, pow, wow moment, there's incredibly long periods of time in the lab, okay, working to try and understand why the instrument isn't doing what you're trying to do, 
or why these guys are not behaving the way you thought they were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in fact, in the science, in the exercise they're doing, that is where the fun is. Okay? The Zing Pao Wow moment is good, okay? But the fun is in, in getting there. But you didn't come for tales of woe, so let's do some Zing Pao Wow because you know that's actually much more fun. So this is a picture taken with the VLT, and you, you're probably wondering that's not very good. That's uh, for the aficionados, that's a half arc second image on an 8.2 meter telescope. Now, any telescope that can do this must be pretty proud of itself, and any astronomer getting this data would be pretty chuffed. And any astronomer like me who grew up in Kunabarabran, observing at least in Kunabarabran, would say, This can't be done. This is too good. You, this is quite incredible. Well, you know what? Those wobbly mirrors that we were talking about just a moment ago can take this image and make it into that. And this is the Zing Pao Wow of adaptive optics. Yeah? It's a technology that was invented in the 70s and 80s by the military and by astronomers independently because we weren't supposed to know about, we weren't supposed to know about what they were doing. I'm sure they knew what we were doing. Yeah? And you may well ask, what has this adaptive optics thing done for me? Well, when you go to the ophthalmologist and they look at your retina, they're actually using adaptive optics technology from the public domain, not from the military guys, but from the astronomers and the reconstruction algorithms from the astronomers to actually work on your eyes. So adaptive optics has actually done something for you. And in fact, as Fred was mentioning, uh, Australia has recently joined uh, as a strategic partner, the, um, uh, the European Southern Observatory. It took some time, uh, 30 years ago when I was working in, uh, in, in Australia, the conversations had started and then it got close, it got so far. I think uh, Australia's habit of changing prime ministers faster than the Hagrinenons of the Cicero's three change their shapes probably causes some bumps along the road. But in any case, you're now in, and being in allows you to take a leadership role in some of the most incredible instrumentation that is coming to, to the VLT. So Mavis is actually an adaptive optics instrument that is so fancy that it will do what you saw before in the infrared, in the visible and over wider fields. So, okay, we've got the great place, we've got all of this stuff. Is again, really, are we, can we get somewhere with this talk? We're getting there, folks, getting there. We're getting here, okay? This is what we're building now. This is the 39 meter extremely large telescope. It's a quarter acre of primary mirror. So the AAT has 12 square meters. That's actually a small room. It's smaller than my office. Okay? The 8.2 meter giants of the VLT have 50 square meters. And that was my student apartment when I was a uh, a graduate student. I could put a kitchen, a bedroom, you can put stuff. 50 square meters is a lot. I was amazed when I saw that. This thing, you can put a house, garage, a backyard, and a pool on. Not that I would let you do it, but, but you can. Okay. So let's see this in perspective. That's one of the 8.2 meter telescopes on the Naismith platform of the ELT. And if you think that's uh, weird, you could actually put the AAT on the Naismith platform of the UT. So you could actually play this game and, and, and keep on stacking them in some bizarre thing. Anyway, why do we want a bigger telescope? Well, bigger is actually almost always better because not only do you collect more light, but you make the stars sharper. Yeah? Making the stars sharper allows you to see nearer in to them and that allows you to see objects really close. Objects like planets, for example. Now, if you think about this, we've detected lots of planets, but we've seen very few. So you can detect them because they make their parent star wobble. You can detect them because they pass in front of the parent star and they dim it. But in general, we've seen very, very few. With a very big telescope, you get to see planets. Now, it isn't that seeing is believing. It is that seeing allows you to detect the light from the planet and actually be able to make measurements of the planet 
as opposed to other tricks that we do right now, which is to make the difference between the planet being in front, behind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is real reason for doing all of this. So before you build it, okay, you have to find somewhere to put it. So you send a bunch of people out to find you a spot uh, and to test it. We didn't give them a very good car, one must admit, but these are the wise people that we sent out. And uh, you test for many, many years because you wouldn't want to go and spend 1 billion euro and put the, the, the telescope on the wrong one. So now we get to the pit where you actually have to design this telescope and, and build it because you can't buy it. It's a prototype. You can't go to a shop and say, make me a 39 meter telescope. Okay? Nobody knows how to do this. Interestingly, space telescopes don't have this problem. Space telescopes, you can go out and buy. Now, they're a, quite a bit more expensive, but it is, that's, a, that's a different story altogether. In any case, so since you can't buy it off the shelf, you go out and, uh, and design it. And indeed, we did this. Uh, we spent uh, three or four years doing that and uh, a few bucks, uh, around 100 million euro, to make sure that everybody was on board and everybody knew what you needed to do. And um, you, what you do is you break it down into pieces that you can buy, and uh, you make sure that industry knows how to make those pieces. And I can see you, coming, uh, well, I can't see you, but I'm, I'm guessing you're going like, but there must be some pieces that you can't buy, like, say like a three by two meter flat mirror weighing 300 kilos that you can wobble at 100 Hertz. You, you surely can't buy that. Indeed, you can't. And that's why you spend decades before doing all kinds of blue skies research, trying to get to the point where some of this will pay off. And some of it will pay off for you, and some of it will pay off for other projects, and some of it may not pay off at all. But observatories and, and big labs are not banks of money for short-term research gains. They're banks of knowledge for our future. In any case, back to, to, to this, this beast that we are now looking at, okay? How would you actually build it? Well, one of the problems is that you can't make the primary mirror in one piece. You see, well, actually that's, uh, that would be fun. You'd actually have to make it in situ, polish it there. But, uh, no, okay, uh, I'm, I'm running away. This is dumb, dumb, dumb. Forget that, we go back. You make it in segments, little hexagons and Lots of people had this idea, but this guy, Jerry Nelson, actually made it work. And Jerry in the telescope community is God, not a God, God. Okay? This chap actually worked out how to make a segmented mirror telescope, made the two 10 meter Keck telescopes and pretty much everything that we do is a heritage of his thinking. So let's get back to our, uh, big telescope. We have, at the Keck telescopes, they had 36 segments. We have 798. And insanity uh, as a plea at this point is not a, a very good choice. So uh, we did quite a lot of prototyping. Uh, these are four. You can actually see the different colors that are different kinds of glass. They're, this is their supports from underneath. And you see these little white things? The white things that are under the segment, those are edge sensors. Now, these are induction sensors that detect how far apart the glass is, how it shears, but most critically, how they move up and down, which allows us to make the primary pretend that it's one big piece. Now, these things are made by a, a, a consortium of companies, French and German company. And uh, as they say, they can measure grass grow on millisecond time scales. Now, that's a pretty idiotic number as well. And if I told you the measured grass grow on a second time scale, would it make any difference? If ever that matter, has anybody ever seen grass grow? I, mean, I think it's just a miracle. It, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. So we have started building this telescope. And in fact, we have pieces, lots of pieces uh, in warehouses, in uh, uh, test chambers, in uh, uh, trucks, uh, being washed, uh, being machined, being transported, 
So this is not some pipe dream only in computer graphics. This is stuff that is really actually happening. Now, some pieces are more photogenic. This is our secondary mirror. This is 4.2 meters across and it is convex. You are looking at the surface that would be shiny. And anybody who is not scared by this is blissfully ignorant. And I would strongly recommend that you remain so because the alternative is abject terror. Um, some pieces are even uh, more photogenic. There's thin pieces of glass that are going to be made into a 2.5 meter deformable mirror that as we were talking about before. In any case, so where are we going to put this? So, you know, those guys in the car, well, we all went off, um, looked at data, measured, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, eventually you go off and actually look at the site. Uh, and we chose one, we chose Cerro Armazones. That's uh, 20 kilometers as the crow flies from Paranal. It was a lot of driving around before we ended up in our backyard, but yeah, or whatever, this car was fun. Uh, Paranal is at the bottom right of this uh, picture and Armazon is on the left in the middle. In the back is a stratovolcano called Yuyayako, which is 6,700 meters high. It's 180 kilometers away uh, from, from Paranal. And the skies are, are, are truly beautiful. Up, uh, up, up at Amazonas. Um, so uh, we chose it, went to the Chilean government, asked politely, we did the environmental impact statement, we did the archaeological stuff, we did all of this stuff, and then finally we blew the top of the mountain. And uh, there are colors in this picture, I don't know if you can really see them, but it's red, white, and blue, which are the colors of the Chilean flag. And we're very proud and, and, and honored to remain in Chile with our long association with this country. But having blown the top of the mountain, we dug a big hole. How big? Well, this is, this is the hole for the foundations. Those are not Lego people. Those are real people. Uh, they are, um, it's, one of them is my friend, uh, Lorenzo Patazzi and some others. So that's a big hole in the ground. And we've kind of started filling it with uh, concrete. Now, one of the things uh, about Chile is that um, it tends to have earthquakes. So uh, in the foundations of this telescope is a really fancy seismic isolation system that we are developing. But I, I, I fear I don't have enough time to discuss it at length. But um, Australia doesn't really have earthquakes. I was in 1989, there was the one in Newcastle, which was 5.6 on the Richter scale, which is really a pretty puny earthquake. Quite remarkable though, because it's peak ground acceleration, which was 0.23 G was very high for that such a puny earthquake. In any case, the seismic isolation system that we're putting in place would cut the earthquakes from the normal ones that we get uh, in the north of Chile, from the Chile Peru Trench, from the Atacama Fault, from the normal basis to the Newcastle basis. So at Newcastle basis, we, 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 we basically are expected to, to, to fly through this. A couple of little things about the telescope before we start wrapping up. Um, you have to be super careful about disturbances. This is, this is actually really quite an unwieldy beast. It is really very big. It's not going to be made stiff. So just uh, an example, if you were to uh, stretch your arms out, and move them close to each other at the length of the, so you just say 1000 and move them from stretched to together. Did you feel the breeze? Probably not. Well, that is about a meter per second. A little bit above that, across the primary mirror of the ELT will change its shape sufficiently that you would get pretty lousy images. On the other hand, if you don't have this breeze across the primary, little pockets of hot air that may be coming from underneath would also cause trouble. You see, the air at different temperature bends light and bendy light makes for lousy images. So in order to fix all of this, we actually have one of these super fancy uh, wobbly mirrors. Uh, now we're experts, right? We all know the nomenclature, adaptive. We have one of these adaptive mirrors that makes stars stable as if they're in space. 
This adaptive mirror is two and a half meters across. That's the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we change its shape a thousand times a second with strokes of up to 100 microns. This is quite a, a miracle of engineering that is being made right now in Spain and in, in Italy. And a smaller version of it, uh, a meter across, is actually on the VLT and other ones in other telescopes. So I promised you that by now, we would actually uh, be getting back to Western Australia. So let's do that and, and start wrapping up. Before anybody shouts, I know this is in New South Wales, but giving a talk about telescopes in Australia and not showing the dish, I'm sure I'd get into trouble. So this is the dish. How does it belong here? Well, actually CSIRO and, um, and Sydney Uni have actually been leading uh, radio astronomy for a, a very long time. There's some debate who invented radio astronomy and I'm not going to go there. Typically history should be written long after anybody who knows anything has left the field. That way it can be changed into whatever anybody wants it to, to say. In any case, a revolution is taking place right now in radio astronomy. And that revolution is happening in your backyard. In Western Australia, in the middle of nowhere, dishes like these are being assembled in a telescope called ASCA with wide fields of view. These telescopes are combined with computers that can drink from this fire hose of data and make images that are quite remarkable in their precision. There's also coat hangers that are mounted upside down in various places. This is a, uh, a computer generated image, but it, it is coming. What is all this for? All of this is partly to go back to the story that I started with, which was what happened to all of those electrons when they separated from the protons. So the universe by separating the electrons from the protons became transparent. And that's why we can actually see. And being able to determine how that happened will tell us how gravity worked in the early universe. Now, one of the problems of modern astronomy is that we've messed up our understanding of gravity and we really don't understand how gravity works in our local universe. There is some hope that if we, if we work it out way back way in you know, 500 billion years after the Big Bang, we may start getting a grip. So we've gone to the quietest place somebody can find and a building Quite an incredible telescope. To be fair, this is not only in Western Australia, this is also in South Africa. And in fact, in, with, with time over the entire African continent will be these two unbelievable telescopes that make the square kilometer. Area. So I think I would like to stop here and leave you with one of my favorite images, which is sunrise from Cerro Amazonas. You see the shadow of the mountain on, on the left and Paranal on the right, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Hey, big, big round of applause for Jason. Um, thank you so much, Jason. That is an extraordinary journey through uh, the technology of astronomy and bringing us right up to date with, uh, with work that is going on now, and which will be uh, seeing uh, the astronomers of the next 20 or 30 years uh, using instruments that, well, when I started in astronomy, I could never have dreamed of. Um, the square kilometre array, which you've just shown a, a picture of the prototype of a square kilometre or thereabouts of, of uh, gathering area for radio waves and a quarter of an acre uh, for light, which is extraordinary. So we are open for questions. Uh, um, Yoli, our producer, who's doing a fan fantastic job in the background, and I mustn't forget to thank her and the, uh, the team from Macquarie University for uh, arranging this uh, event. Uh, but Yoli's um, basically uh, looking out for any questions that might come in. Before um, 
before we do that, before we find any of your questions, because there aren't any yet, I'm going to ask one of my own, if that's all right, Jason, if you don't mind uh, uh, me taking the lead, because I'm really interested in uh, what you might call your non-Zing Pow Wow moment, um, when you were playing down the nitty gritty of observing. And I know what you had on the screen there uh, was uh, something that uh, is really very interesting. And I wonder if, do you have time to say a little bit more about what we were looking at there? So it's, what you're seeing there is a, an, the detection of light orbiting the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And this is um, quite, a, quite an incredible image. So uh, the material that, that is uh, orbiting uh, the, the black hole is actually occasionally flaring. And you can track one of these flares going around the, uh, the black hole. To do this, um, the numbers are quite spectacular. I tried not to, <laughs> not to go into the numbers, but you're talking about measuring the position of something on the sky to micro arc second accuracy. This is a precision that is not only unimaginable in terms of optical astronomy, the average image from a telescope is of the order of an arc second. So a micro arc second is a 10 to the a millionth of that you are actually imaging something to a millionth of the diameter. And this is done through the instrument that was, uh, the movie that was playing uh, right at the beginning, a thing called Gravity. And it is part of the work that <clears throat> was awarded the Nobel Prize this year to Andrea Goetz and uh, Reinhard Genzel. Reinhard Genzel is actually the PI, not the PI of this instrument, but he is the director of the uh, Institute that, that built this instrument, and it's also been a 30-year project. It is, uh, it really is a Zing Pao Wow image. It just doesn't look Zing Pao Wow-y. That's that's all. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I love the expression. Lots of questions on the on, on my thing. I don't know if we're seeing different screens. No, I think we're seeing the same one. So um, we've got a, a lovely array of questions here. I've just answered one for you because I know the answer uh, by typing it in. But um, let me uh, try and put those in uh, a bit of uh, order. So if you question doesn't come up, don't lose heart. There's a, a really good uh, clutch of questions. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, we've got thank yous for you too, Jason, which I'm not surprised about. Uh, here's one uh, which I think is a question commonly asked of people who are interested in telescopes. It's from David Wintle. Would building a 39 meter telescope on the moon produce vastly better images? So, um, yes, I think is the, 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 the short answer. Removing the atmosphere, uh, would actually make things an awful lot better. Uh, and the sky is a lot darker. In fact, the, you know, the, the, when I was talking about the darkest part of the sky and observing six photons against the dark part of the sky, the, the, the sky is actually quite bright. In fact, it's got emission. When you look out even on a moonless night in the black part, there's, there's lots of light coming from there and various lines of, uh, uh, oxygen or other other elements. So the sky, although it appears black, isn't. We're, at the moon, uh, at least you know the, the, the dark side of the, <laughs> of the moon, uh, it would be uh, pretty uh, pretty dark. And in fact, even on the bright side, since there's very little scattering, uh, as long as you're not pointing towards something uh, bright like the thing that keeps us up during the day, um, the sky is pretty dark. So yes, it would be a lot better. I don't think it's feasible. Uh, at least I wouldn't set out to do that in my lifetime. I'm going to have enough trouble with this one. But, but yes, it would, it would be much better. And, and just coming back to, uh, thanks for that, Jason, just coming back to Earth and, the, you know, accepting the reality that we do have uh, an atmosphere that we're sitting at the bottom of, 
Um, I mean, the, the image that you showed of the stars uh, in orbit around the black hole at the center of the galaxy, you said it was half an arc second wide and the detail within that is absolutely staggering. Uh, but we've got a question uh, from uh, Rishi Mystery. How much more resolution do you think ground-based telescopes can extract? Are we right at the limit? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that um, uh, just like the radio uh, community uh, with interferometers, we are we are at the uh, at at the moment where a decision will have to be made at some point whether we go down the path of interferometry for some things or or filled aperture telescopes. And they are complementary. It is not that one replaced the other. As you see, the dish is still there. Well, in Narrabri, the Australia telescope is also there. So it's not, it's not one or the other. But in terms of resolution, I think interferometry at this point is uh, showing its, its metal in the optical. It isn't quite as simple. I think I'd like to take a minute on this because people say, oh, we're doing it in the radio. What's so, what's so hard? Well, radio photons are pretty long. Okay? Doing things in a photon that's got a wavelength of a meter or even centimeters is not easy. Certainly not easy, but it is an awful lot easier than doing it with a photon that has a length of a micron or a couple of microns. Um, the other thing is that radio waves can be amplified. Uh, and actually, for that matter, you can store the data and post-process it. What you're seeing in an instrument like gravity and an instrument like the VLTI is a live correlator. This is being done live. You don't get a second chance. Once the photon, it is one photon that has hit all telescopes at the same time. It isn't separate photons. This is the magic of quantum mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. But this one photon went through all of these telescopes. And if you don't get the interference, you didn't, you, you've missed it. So it's actually pretty hard, but I think the future is an interferometry. Um, that actually uh, links to a question from George Shaiko. Is it feasible for optical interferometry across continents on the scale of the SKA? I think actually- No, not. Certainly not today for the kind of reasons that I was mentioning. So if you can store the data. So last year, uh, there was much justified uh, excitement because the Event Horizon Telescope published this absolutely spectacular image of uh, the shadow of a black hole. That was done by collecting the data in various telescopes and bringing it to a place where the processing could be done. Um, that we cannot do in the optical yet. You'd have to timestamp the photons with a precision that we are unable to do. So um, we are not there. It is not impossible, but it is not the first path to, to go down. First, we need to work out the, the rest of it, which we are doing on Paranal right now. We're doing this, the, the interferometer is quite, a, it's quite an incredible thing. It's not thousands of people typing in all the time. It is really, a machine you go and you observe with the interferometer. So yeah, it will happen and maybe, but not in my lifetime. We've got a few comments as well, Jason. Um, Nuria Laurenti is volunteering to go to the moon to help commission uh, an optical telescope there. So <laughs> just send a postcard, Nuria, when you're ready to go. Uh, there's a, a gentleman called David Merlin as well, who has uh, written a few words. David, of course, is the reason why we have the Alison Levick Lecture, the former um, and legendary astrophotographer at the AO uh, who set this this lecture series up. Uh, David says, Jason, brilliant description of the early universe, eccentric and delightful talk, full in detail and in jokes. It will be good to see you in Oz again. So that's an invitation. <laughs> you know where he lives. <laughs> um, there we have a number of other uh, questions. Let me, oh, there, here's one that I think is rather a nice one from David Barnes. Is there a technical reason why it wasn't 40 meters or 38 meters? So it started off, um, uh, we, we started off with a concept called OWL, which was 100 meters that uh, Fred uh, felt uh, and published uh, was unwise. It's a conversation that Fred and I have had over, uh, over beers 
often enough, and almost certainly he was right. Um, but uh, in the process of uh, getting a reality check, we went down to 42. Uh, 42 is uh, uh, actually a, a good number. Scientifically, it, it works. It's the answer to the life, the universe, and everything, although that did not was not our first thought. And this is really honest, honest to God. It really was not our first thought. It also is the geometric mean between 60 and 30, which actually is uh, a slightly less scientific and more less amusing version. So we designed, in fact, and the design process was for a 42 meter telescope. Um, budget wise, it was on the edge of what we could do. And risk wise, it was also on the edge of what we could do. So our management said, what would you do to make it a safer bet? So by going from 42 to 39, we shrank the secondary mirror from six meters to 4.2, which made it much easier both to polish and to make. It also removed a lot of the technical stress on the telescope in terms of wind shake, et cetera, et cetera. And it shrunk our production from a thousand something segments to 798. We actually still make a thousand because there's the spares, but that's another, that's another story. So um, it is 39 for those reasons. For those of you who are unhappy about losing the 42, uh, in imperial units, it is actually 42 yards. So, uh, and, and as telescopes are always made in imperial units, uh, I think everybody knows that, it actually uh, works quite well. So I think that's, that's the reason why it is 39. Do you know it in inches off the top of your head, Jason? No, no, the inches, the inches actually in, uh, are unamusing. That's why I don't know. But the 42 yards is actually, I think, suitable because, you know, for all the discussions that people have, oh, you tune this parameter for this science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, you know, it is the imperial units, the rule. Um, there's a, quite a few technical questions, which um, I hope we'll get to. Let me just put some more general ones to you uh, first, Jason. One from Nick Cernias, who you know well, uh, another former colleague at the AO, now at AO Macquarie. Uh, he wants to know, uh, and I, I sort of answered this earlier on, on online, but um, I, I might have the wrong answer. Uh, when does the ELT come online? And part two of the question, is what keeps you awake at night in the lead up to that? Oh, okay, so uh, part one, right now we're looking at uh, commissioning in four to five years from now. So we hope that uh, online will be uh, a couple of years after that. Yes. Um, we, uh, I sincerely hope that it will be in that time scale because otherwise I'll retire and not be able to at least fall asleep on a sofa in the control room, which is I think my, my normal routine. Uh, the list of things that keep me up at night is very long and it just shuffles itself uh, on a, I'd say weekly basis, not daily basis. Uh, right now, there are, uh, there are effects, very subtle effects to do with the fact that the detection of the wavefront is uh, in a segmented uh, telescope and with uh, um, very big spiders, we actually have a double segmentation issue in the wavefront, which subtly uh, produces aliasing effects and causes control issues in spaces that we didn't, we did expect, but we didn't want. And that's, called, it's called petaling or islanding. And that's what keeps me up at night, but I'm sure the global audience is really, quite uninterested in, in, in that particular <laughs> part. Well, the, the, the opposite side of that question comes from Jolene McCabe, who asks, what's the first, the first thing you want to look for with the ELT? Oh, oh. Um, so there's, there, there's, a, there's an easy answer to that, which is that every telescope that I've uh, had the pleasure of, uh, or the honor, of having uh, the commission recommissioned uh, operate has a default target. Uh, 
uh, and that is also on the VLT. You push the button. If you start up the panel and you push the button, the telescope goes to supernova 19878. Eight. <laughs> and um, you, know, you can change it if you want, but the telescope goes to supernova 19878. Eight. And one of the great pleasures uh, as being director of uh, Paranal was that some of the carpets in the residence where the astronomers and the engineers sleep uh, on the site, uh, the carpets have spectra of 1987A, some of the carpets, uh, which were made from observations taken with the uh, early instrumentation. Okay, just, just let's be a little bit more technical just for a minute. There's some more wider ranging questions I'd like to get to, but um, Lisa Moore, uh, hi Lisa, asks how many different shapes are there for the 798 mirrors? Presumably different shapes from the center to the edge component. So there's 133 uh, seg, uh, shapes and there are six pizza slices installed in the telescope and a seventh made separately. So the, um, uh, the seventh is not a spare in the context or in the, the normal sense. But in order to keep the primary coated appropriately, you actually have to recode the primary of a telescope every 18 months, more or less. So if you think about this, this means that for the ELT, we are recoating two segments every day. So there's a, a crane that goes in, takes a segment, takes it out, and, and you put another segment in its place. So what you do is you put the spare in its, in its place. And in fact, what is happening is that the segment is clocked as you as you go around. So it goes this way in one and, and, and turned around. So there's 133 uh, families uh, of segments and they all have different shapes. And in fact, they're all off axis A spheres individually. So if they're positioned slightly wrong, then the whole telescope uh, has the wrong shape because an off axis A sphere in the wrong place gives you astigmatism and all kinds of things. So it's actually quite a delicate process of, of management. And, and another technical question from Bob McLean. Um, what's the focal length of the ELT? And I assume that <coughs> the final. Uh, right, it's an F17.8 uh, design at the, at the Naismith Focus. The telescope is actually re-entrant. So it actually has a, a first focus after M1 and M2 which is at f4, f4.4, which is also at the center of the quaternary mirror. So the, uh, the deformable mirror itself is both at almost a pupil and at the image plane. And for optical people, you realize that that is both a place where you can make everything go wrong, but if you get it right there, you pretty much got, right, got everything right afterwards. So it's a double-edged, so, but it's f seventeen point eight at the at the focus. Yeah. Um, so multiply thirty nine point three by seventeen point eight, and you've got the focal length, and it's a long way, as, as you say, Bob. It's hundreds of meters. Um, there was one question that interested me as well, uh, which I've lost now. We've got so many questions. Uh, it, it was about the, as you said, the the, the one meter per second. Okay, it's from Nigel Garvey. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk, uh, as everybody's saying. Um, on a technical note, uh, oh, I have so many questions really, but to be simple, given the effect of air moving across the mirror at one meter per second and the open view doors, how does one stop it moving near the mirror? How do you prevent that? So, so we don't. In fact, we are specified that what we actually want is two meters, one and a half to two meters across the primary all the time because we're more bothered by the bubbles of hot air than the slow wind across the primary. So the combination of our edge sensors and these actuators that move the mirror, it will allow us to keep the mirror continuous in spite of the airflow. And it won't have the right shape, but it will be continuous. And what we then do is take the shape out in the deformable mirror, which is at the, at the quaternary. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we, uh, one of the uh, interesting things and very hard for a lot of our instrumentation colleagues to 
digest is that uh, the ELT is never operated at prescription. It is actually a telescope that is operated in a corridor of acceptability, but it is not a telescope that is operated to its design. In fact, it's designed to be able to actually take up its unwieldy nature. And this actually is very hard for people who are used to going to a telescope, strapping an instrument on, focusing the telescope to their instrument, and then we're done. Okay? This, is, this is really a, a very different concept. And the start of these ideas came already at the VLT, where this is actually done. So it, it is, this unwieldy context, context is part of the VLT, the unit telescope's uh, operation scenario. It's just that it's done so cleanly that the users don't feel a thing. So it's actually, they, they, they believe that they're working on a, on, on a normal telescope. On the ELT, that belief cannot be, that, that context cannot be created for you. You have to accept this, this reality and these are conversations that take place. So there's, there's quite a lot of evolution also in the thinking of what a telescope actually is when you get of this size. Um, that re related to that is a question from Kelvin Wellington, who says you've much to do when operational. Uh, what future back ends are envisaged, which I guess we would, uh, uh, you know, mean the instrumentation that's going to be used on the telescope. So there's there's uh, three instruments that are in construction right now. Uh, when we call instruments now or back, back ends, whatever you want to call them, these things are the size of um, actually a two meter telescope each. And these are the instruments. So the, the, the movable telescopes that we have on Paranal, which are 1.8 meters, are smaller than the instruments that we're building for the uh, ELT. They, they are huge, huge things. Um, so there's instruments that are doing imaging with adaptive optics, everybody's with adaptive optics, but there's instruments that are doing imaging in the near infrared, mid infrared, there's uh, uh, what are called IFUs, integral field units, which uh, image and take spectra of patches of sky simultaneously. Uh, these are consortia of uh, institutions, a bit like the list of uh, institutes that were on the Mavis slide that I showed, which were, you know, lots of people all over the place. This is the same for, for these instruments. These are instruments that are costing tens of millions of, uh, of euros and have hundreds of man years of effort into them. But there are, these are part of the deliverable of the construction. And then, as is normal for astronomical observatories, there is an ongoing budget for instrumentation that continues to make sure that we are up to date with the newest uh, facilities. So Mavis again is an example of a third generation instrument for the, for the VLT, uh, which is funded by us, uh, at least for the hardware. Thanks, Jason. Um, we've got a few questions that are about the relationship between the ELT and other telescopes. Uh, and perhaps we can do a couple of those. Kaio wants to know, what's the difference between the James Webb telescope and the 39 meter telescope? Which one would take better pictures? <laughs> Nobody beats James Webb on sensitivity in the bands that James Webb works. No one. Okay. Putting a telescope at the Lagrangian point, cooling it, and uh, being able to have the, uh, the backgrounds that it has is un unbeatable. Okay. So, uh, but that's raw sensitivity. In terms of angular resolution, James Webb is not that big a telescope, six and a half meters. So the uh, wave properties of light are not violated by going to uh, Lagrangian orbits, and you can't you can't beat uh, Rayleigh. So uh, the the resolution that the ELT will achieve is an order of magnitude better than James Webb. The number of photons that the ELT is suffering from background in other places is higher than James Webb. So there, I think the, the, 
general agreement of how we argue this is that there's a complementarity. James Webb goes deep in imaging, we go deep in spectroscopy. James Webb tells us where to look super sharp, we look super sharp there. So it's not one or the other, but at a very basic point, no one beats James Webb in terms of sensitivity. This is, it's, it's quite an incredible machine and it will be such a pleasure to finally see it fly. Which I believe is next year, is that right? When we are expecting to With see James it. Webb, it has been next year for quite some years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, two uh, of our questioners, uh, Rosalind Wiggum and Tad Back, have asked about um, the Arecibo telescope. Uh, Rosalind says, do you think Arecibo will ever be rebuilt or will other telescopes fill the void? So um, the, the Arecibo concept has, of course, been uh, replicated in China with a thing called FAST, which is 500 meters in diameter and is uh, operating right now. So. Uh, building another Arecibo from a science point of view is kind of difficult. Uh, the biggest obstacle, however, to rebuilding Arecibo is that Puerto Rico is not a state. Mm. You see, when a telescope collapses in a state, then the state senator has a real incentive for getting money for people to rebuild it, which happened in Charlottesville when uh, one of the telescopes collapsed there. So while it's a, a great, great shame uh, what's passed at Arecibo, I would like to say something that I think generally people are missing. These things have a design lifetime. They're not designed to live forever. And this will apply also to your favorite dish and applies also to the Giorgio Bank telescope. And at some point, they're not designed to last forever. And it doesn't matter how much maintenance you do to it, it isn't an issue of looking after it. Stresses get built into structures and they don't come out just by painting it a brighter color. So I think, in fact, while we all adore some of these things, one of the greatest problems, of, and I know there's been it's been regarded as a colossal achievement that the dish is now some kind of heritage status in Australia, that means that the people who are responsible for keeping it up now have something that was not designed to be kept up, to keep up. So one has to be a little bit careful about uh, this. In any case, because I, I read on various places, oh, they didn't maintain it right, et cetera, et cetera. I see what lasted 57 years. Nobody in their right minds thought that it would last 57 years when they built it. It wasn't built to last 57 years. So I think the word we should take from Arecibo is that it's been an unbelievable success. And be thankful that nobody got injured at the end. Well, that's what brought it to a halt, isn't it? The, the fact that it couldn't be repaired without endangering human life, which is not kind of what we want. Uh, continuing talking about other instruments, uh, Mark Casali, who is director of AO Macquarie and who you know well, <laughs> having worked with him at ESO, he says, uh, he asks, what's coming, <coughs> excuse me, what's coming after the ELT and the SKA? What do you see as the next big thing on the horizon beyond these already mega science projects? Retirement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that you have to, okay so when i when i started uh, working on on telescopes uh, i finally understood that the people thinking about building the vlt had been criminally insane it was impossible to build to do this it was truly impossible they, they could not be in their right minds but indeed they they actually uh, built it. I was privileged to be part of it and uh, privileged to, to, to contribute to that. At some point, somebody said, let's go build a bigger one. And indeed, I felt that I was insane. It was impossible. You can't. You can't. This is, this is just ridiculously hard. 
and you sit down and you do the numbers. Uh, as Jerry would say, if the laws of physics don't stop you, then just do the numbers, work it out, work the problem, work the problem, work the problem. And eventually, you know, it's only the laws of physics that stop you. The one thing that's for sure is that the generation that builds the next one should not be restricted by people like me saying, you're criminally insane, it can never be done. They should be allowed to work the numbers themselves. And for sure, I have no idea how to do anything. I'm, I'm having enough trouble with this one. I have no, no clue how hard the next one can or ought to be. I sincerely hope that somebody is, feels crazy enough to do something, but I have no idea what it would be. I don't think, yes, I don't think any of us can answer to guess on that. Um, I had one more technical question. Uh, here it is uh, from, I'm not sure whose name this is, but it looks like Bibana. Uh, how far, well, how far along is the adaptive optics going for the ELT? And what's the expected field of view for it? That's the crucial thing with these adaptive optics. Okay. There? So, um, we are now ESO has been, we, we are now in uh, I think one two three I think fourth or fifth generation adaptive optic system ESO has been at the forefront of adaptive optics on the ground uh, really uh, truly at the, at the forefront uh, with instruments that went on the three point six meter on La Silla, uh things like Camon Camon Plus all kinds of all kinds of things Adonis many instruments. So this is our this would be our fourth generation system on on the uh, on the ELT, and uh, I think we now are really uh, talking about uh, concepts of operation that are I don't want to say routine because nothing that we do in any of these instruments is or telescopes is routine, but it is based on very well understood not experimental physics. It is actually you know, doing, doing. So it's very, very far along. All the instruments will be yeah, using adaptive optics. This is not an option. The telescope is operated in closed loop adaptive optics mode. There is no passive mode for the ELT. The, this simply, as I tried to explain about the shape of the primary, etc., it does not work without the adaptive optics. It literally just doesn't. Um, the field of view, uh, for the multi-conjugate adaptive optic system that will feed uh, uh, Mikado, which is one of the instruments. So Maori feeding Mikado is a one arc minute field of view with four milli arc second pixels. So you can, you can do the, the arithmetic about how many pixels you have across the sky, but uh, you, you actually uh, have a one arc minute field of view. I, I think probably there's people in the audience from Mavis who would be able to answer the question of how Mavis does. I think it's similar in, in size, uh, in the visible, in, uh, uh, on the UTs. So this is an incredible complementarity. What the ELT does in terms of resolution in the infrared, Mavis does in, uh, in the optical. That's the, the beauty of uh, the uh, diffraction. Um, Jason, you've been extraordinarily generous in answering this plethora of questions and um, your, uh, your prowess in answering them is uh, reflected in the fact that the numbers on our, on our uh, webinar have barely gone down since you stopped talking. So you've done a great job. I'm going to wrap up with one final question, uh, if I may, if you're not too tired. <laughs> It's just the start of your day, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> you can have another coffee after this. Um, this is from Mark. I suspect it's not Mark Casali, <laughs> because the question is, what is the coolest thing you can see in the night sky? And you can interpret the coolest in any way you want. <laughs> the, the cosmic microwave background. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, at 2.7 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is about as close to absolute zero as I would, I would certainly tell my photons uh, to be. Uh, and I think that is the, that is the coldest. Uh, the coolest thing in astronomy is uh, 
whatever Zimpao Wow moment uh, Fred has decided to tell us about this week or next week or whatever, we cool things are coming all the time. It's one of the true joys, I think, in astronomy and partly with telescopes, is that we're still very much in the exploration phase of our science. So build, going deeper, going further, going wider, all is uh, giving us uh, really quite incredible views and quite incredible new, new physics. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the coolest thing for me remains uh, watching the remnants of an exploding star uh, halfway across the universe and being able to actually tell by how bright it is how gravity works across our entire universe. I think this is, this is uh, quite an incredible uh, feat of observation, physics, uh, gravity, and also, you know, the fact that we, we get to see our universe. This is, this is pretty cool. Fantastic answer. Um, I know that we are uh, scheduled to do the closing remarks at five to eight, but Jason, I think we've worked you very hard. Uh, it is uh, five to 10 in the morning, if my calculations are right, in Munich. <laughs> and you've had a very, uh, very um, hard, uh, if, if I can put it that way, you've had a hard chore to start your day. I like my days to start fairly gently. Um, I think you've done extraordinarily well. So we might uh, wrap up at this point and um, I'd like to say a few thank yous um, and I'd like to start actually with the audience. Um, there have been 129 of you online uh, and it's not much uh, fewer than that now. It has been fantastic to see you all here. Your questions have been terrific. Thank you very much for uh, sending them all in. Uh, they're all on the money and they've been a pleasure to listen to uh, when uh, Jason has answered them. Um, but this event didn't happen without a lot of um, action behind the scenes and I think all I did was tinker around and put my foot in it to kind of you know slow progress down <laughs> as one always does. Uh, but I'd like to thank the team at Macquarie University, um, in particular Yoli Perez, uh, Danielle Henna, Kylie Perry, uh, Daisy Liu, who's going to be putting this talk, uh, actually, I think she will, I don't think she'll put it online, but she will put it onto the AO website. It'll be on the Macquarie University YouTube uh, channel and um, people will be able to see it if you want to uh, see it again, or if you know somebody who you think ought to be watching this, uh, it will be possible to find it. Um, I'd like to thank Nick Cernias too of, uh, of AO Macquarie for moral, moral support. Uh, I also forgot to mention at the outset, well I think I did mention it but not in any detail, that um, yes the event is sponsored by the Department of Industry, Science, uh, Energy and Resources and that's how, how come I'm still mixed up with it because I work for that organisation. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, colleagues there, in particular um, Andrew Newman, who is the person who formally manages the Alison Levick bequest now. Uh, he and another colleague, Andrew Stevenson, the two Andrews, uh, spend a lot of time worrying about um, you know, how this bequest works and how all the funding is being dealt with, especially in an era where interest rates are zero. Uh, so the bequest will carry on. We'll have another talk next year, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you to everybody involved. I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Uh, I've got a terrible habit of doing that. Um, I usually have to include the cat and anybody else who I can think of just to make sure. I should probably thank uh, Jutta, your other half, Jason, for letting you leave for work early. Uh, and Theodore, I know, had your car uh, until not very long before the talk. Uh, thank you, everybody, again. Thank you especially to you, Jason. You've done a marvellous job today, a fabulous talk and a fabulous uh, set of questions with real insights that most of us don't think about too hard, even those of us who are mad on telescopes. So well done. Thank you again. And um, I'll see you soon, I hope. <laughs> Cheers for now.
Thank you very much.